So we'll kick things off today. Again, welcome. You are, are here on our Fair Trade Month um, webinar from Fair Trade Campaigns. Today we're, we're talking about authentic fair trade storytelling. Um, really excited to hear from a number of speakers sharing their own expertise and, and stories with us today. Um, joining us for this conversation, uh, we will hear from Andrew Gonzalez. He's the supply chain specialist for sugar and superfoods at Fairtrade USA, where he helps facilitate the implementation and impact of the Fairtrade program at Origin. Also with us is Joy McBrien. She's the founder and CEO of Fair Anita, a social enterprise that strives to build a more inclusive economy for women by providing economic opportunity and dignified jobs. And finally joining us is Jenna Tanner. She's a content strategist at Noonday Collection, an Austin-based ethical accessories brand. At Noonday, she's responsible for sharing Noonday's story through print and digital channels. She also helps train the company's network of Noonday ambassadors. Uh, so we'll hear more from Andrew, Joy, and Jenna as we move into today's conversation. So with that, I will open things up and Joy, sh turn over to you. I believe we're not sharing slides for you, so I will let us see our, each other's faces. <laughs> and you the floor. Yay, thank you, thank you. Happy Fair Trade Month, everybody. Excited to be with you all here today. Um, of course, no Fair Trade USA and Noonday well, uh, leaders in fair trade. Uh, fair Anita is, is a smaller, smaller guy. Um, we've been around for not quite four years. Uh, our goal is to bring fair trade to a more mainstream audience. So we say we're cute, ethical, and affordable. Um, we work with women in nine countries. We're based in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, and we're really looking at designing pieces, like I said, that are for more of a mainstream audience, maybe a little bit younger. Um, yeah, I started Farinita about four years ago uh, because of my own history with rape and sexual violence. And so the women that we partner with around the world tend to have these uh, similar histories. And so uh, telling authentic stories has has always been somewhat of a balancing act for us, um, especially with this piece about violence against women, uh, because I think it's really important that we're talking about it and that more people are talking about violence against women um, and that we're using our brand presence to talk about this important issue in addition to fair trade and economic self-sufficiency and all of that. Um, but of course, not all artisans want uh, to have this aspect of their identity shared with our customer, which we totally respect. So, can be a little bit difficult to juggle um, wanting to share this and respecting everyone's um, identities, of course. Um, so when we do end up talking about violence against women, a lot of times uh, I, I tend to stick with my own story because it's a story that, that I own, um, that I'm free to share with people, or there's like certain artisans who have said like, um, like they want us to share their story and they've talked to us about how to share that story. Um, and so, yeah, when I'm thinking about authentic storytelling, I think that combined with, um, our main customer is a millennial and millennials are really looking for like, who are the people behind this product? And yes, a lot of times that's the artisans, but it's also like our team here. Right. And so how do we, um, how do we make sure that we're keeping artisans front and center while still being true to what our customer wants it in that way too. Um, we see engagement as being a lot higher on our social media and different pieces um, when, we're, when we're talking about our team here, a lot of times even more so than when we're talking about um, artisans. So, so it's, it's been a, an interesting journey as we've grown as an organization over the last four years to figure out like how do we actually balance this. Um, but ultimately what we've learned is that um, artisans, the artisan partners that we work with don't necessarily want their face front and center um, all the time. They, they are really looking to have their products front and center. Um, and that's what we try to do. So when we're selling products, we, we look first at design, second at price point, and then third, talk about a story. So we want to make sure that these are products that customers are really excited about, that they're actually going to wear. Um, and that's what our artisan partners are excited about too. So 
when we meet with artisans, uh, the thing I'm always asking over and over again is, what what do you want our customers to know about you? What do you want What do you want to say to our customers? And the number one answer is always like, we're grateful they're buying, and we hope they keep buying products, right? And so, unfortunately, this isn't necessarily what our customers want to hear over and over again. Um, they want to hear more of like a, a life story, I guess, like something where they feel like they can connect with uh, the women that we partner with around the world. Um, but <laughs> uh, our artisan partners are, of course, proud of the work that they've created, and they want that to be front and center. Um, so. I, I think for a long time there um, there have been maybe mission-based organizations that put more of like a, a sob story along with products to help them sell uh, like guilt and pity I think can sell products really easily um, but our artisans like they want you to actually love it they want you to wear it you know they want to they love when we send pictures to our artisan partners of uh, customers wearing the jewelry and and models wearing the jewelry and all these things. Um, it's one of their favorite pieces. Um, and so, so we're trying to figure out how do we, um, how, how do we change this conversation so that it's not one of guilt and pity, but rather one of like talking about how our, our partners are powerful and change making and uh, maintain that piece of agency and realize that all of us entering into these relationships um, are multifaceted individuals, right? So uh, one of our artisan partners talked a lot about her identity uh, through fair trade and how before she used to be seen in her community as like a street rat, lowest caste, whatnot. And now because of uh, fair trade, she's seen as an internationally renowned artisan and like how powerful that transformation has been in her identity. And I think it's of utmost importance to us as a brand to respect, um, to respect that and to to play on the uh, or not to play to um, I don't know, talk about how talented of an artisan she is as opposed to the poverty that she might have come from or um, what that looks like. And I can I can see this in my own life too. Um, sometimes when uh, there's articles written a, a, about me, it'll say like headlines will be something like rape survivor or helping other rape survivors, and I feel like it's like clickbait or like, you know, they're, they're almost like exploiting one aspect of my identity. And whereas I'd much rather be known as like entrepreneur or, you know, what have you. Um, and so I think like making sure that we're cognizant of um, the many facets of the, the partners that we're working with and having that come across in the stories that we are telling is, uh, is really important. Um, so um, of course there's there's some artisan partners that are excited to have their their faces and stories shared um and so we're just really trying to change the way that we're talking about artisan partners um the easiest way for me to check this is i'm actually facebook friends with a ton of our artisan partners and so i think like when i'm gonna post something um online about a partnership i i think like okay is like is this is this the way I would talk about one of my best friends online? Like, is this how um, I would want to be talked about, right? And like, she's gonna see this. <laughs> like, what is she gonna think when she reads this? Is this a way that she wants to be represented? Is this how she has asked us to represent her? Um, and so that's been a really good um, check for me. Like I said, we, we ask all artisans like what they want us to share with partners or with our customers. And a lot of times they'll give us little quotes. And so we put, um, we put a quote from artisans on the back of each tag uh, of our product tags. And so again, going in our order of like, we're hoping that customers are first attracted to a product because of the design, might flip over the tag, stay because of a price point, and then read that story piece. And maybe that's what converts them. Maybe they're already sold. Um, either way, um, making sure that's, that's still a very uh, present piece of, of the story because we're really trying to figure out how do we create that more empathetic relationship between maker and, and uh, consumer. So I think ultimately when we're talking about building authentic relationships, um, we have to remember that like fair trade isn't, fair trade is fantastic, but it isn't like 
the savior, right? Like, like women artisans are creating better lives for themselves using this economic self-sufficiency as a tool, um, but it's not the only answer and we're partnering with them um, to create this success, but making sure that they're maintaining their own agency just as we expect to maintain ours. Um, yeah, I don't know. At, at Fair Anita, we're always looking to uh, create a world where women can feel safe, valued, and respected no matter their geography. And I think that will only happen when we're investing in one another's full selves, not merely uh, an artisan's ability to produce, um, that we can like create these authentic relationships with one another and therefore talk about them in an authentic way. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joy. There's a lot of really good information in there and, and um, tips for us to, to take away, right? Telling, telling our own stories and making that part of the conversation as well is, I think, really powerful, right? Because we can all speak from, from where we are um, yeah. to, to talk about the things that we are, are passionate about. Um, Thanks. Thank you. So again, we will have time for, for questions and conversation at the end. Um, if you do have questions come to mind now, feel free to once again share them in the chat. Um, but we'll keep things moving with our, our initial presentations. And I will turn the floor over to Jenna Tanner at Noonday. Uh, and Jenna, I have your, your slides here. So we'll pull that up and get you started. Awesome. Yeah, well, first, um, Joy, I loved everything that you shared. I think we have a very similar philosophy in terms of the importance of leading with designs that people love and also, you know, not not putting out a single story about what it looks like to be one of these artisans and not just depicting sob stories. So um, I think we share a lot in common there and I would love to share more in general about our sort of approach to storytelling in the Q&A if anyone has specific questions. So. I was asked to specifically speak to Noonday's ambassador program and how we do storytelling there and social media. So, um, Joy, you can go ahead and click, or sorry, Susie, go ahead and click. Okay. Uh, so just a little about Noonday collection. Um, I've included sort of our mission statement and our vision statement. Basically, um, we were founded in 2011 by Jessica Honiger and the business started as a fundraiser for her adoption. Um, she had basically gotten connected with some artisans that were working in Uganda that were really talented and were creating beautiful things but didn't have a marketplace for their products uh, locally. So she began selling their products as a way to fundraise for her family's adoption and ended up um, hosting the first noonday trunk show in her home. Basically, she just set out all the products and invited her friends over and people really loved it. So it kind of took off from there. And today we partner with 31 different artisan businesses in 14 countries around the world. And um, we partner with about 4,500 artisans who are making our products. So the primary way we sell is pretty much consistent with how New Day was born. We're still um, a direct sales company. So we sell through a network of what we call ambassadors and we define them as stylists, storytellers, and social entrepreneurs. So basically these ambassadors own their own Noonday collection businesses. They partner with hostesses in their communities to hold trunk shows just like Jessica did for the very first one. And they um, set out all their jewelry and they are able to tell the stories behind the collection in person. And that's a very intentional choice on Noonday's part to continue to have this business model as opposed to brick and mortar or primarily e-commerce. Um, we really think that the trunk show model presents a great way for um, people to gather together in person and have real connections in person and also hear hear the stories behind the collection in person. And we think that that's just a really great way to tell Noonday's story. So that's kind of the, the primary driver behind the ambassador program. So you can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so like I was mentioning, the trunk show model is really designed for storytelling. Um, and so part of my job is equipping ambassadors to tell the stories behind Noonday at their trunk shows. And there are so many um, 
strengths that come with this model, you know, these women are really passionate about what they're doing, the impact they're having, and inviting other people into that impact. Um, it also presents unique challenges, though. I mean, when you're just sort of doing corporate storytelling, you have total control over the message and how it's delivered. And we have a network of 1,700 women. So, you know, we can't go to each of their trunk shows and, you know, control really tightly exactly how they're telling our story. So that is kind of a unique challenge that we deal with. And I think the way that we approach it is, first of all, trying to build a really strong corporate communications and storytelling. So we're kind of setting the example basically um, by presenting stories on our channels, social media, email, web, um, print catalog, whatever it is. And that serves the purpose of both kind of defining the messaging that we want um, ambassadors to pick up and use and also just um, providing a great tool for them and their businesses because they it saves them from having to like write their own stories or create their own images with text or whatever it is so we want them to be able to spend more time storytelling and selling our products and less time creating marketing collateral and things like that so um we sort of have two channels of marketing corporate and ambassador and on our ambassador side we're um just thinking about everything that they need to have a successful trunk show and to be able to tell our story. So we create um, social media images that they can share um, that sort of depict products being made or invite people to shop. And we also create print collateral that they can display at their trunk shows. So um, you can kind of see in the photos here, but um, this is sort of a typical trunk show set up in someone's home. And our catalog is definitely uh, one of our primary storytelling tools for ambassadors at trunk shows. So we put a lot of work into that. And um, we actually just this past year released our first impact report, which um, is now included in every catalog. So that is a great way that we've been able to equip ambassadors with the some numbers behind the impact that they can share with their customers at trunk shows. Okay, can go to the next one. So this is another way that we equip ambassadors to do storytelling. They can't have the opportunity to earn trips to go visit some of our artisan partners. Um, these photos are from Guatemala. And so every year we take about five groups of ambassadors to meet um, the women and men that they're partnering with face-to-face -face. and these trips end up just being really incredible opportunities for connection um it just allows the ambassadors to really put you know they might have put a face to a name through if they read a blog or whatever but just meeting them in person is so powerful so this is something that is a huge motivator for our community and really um these women bring back you know, stories and experiences of connecting with the artisans that are really valuable to them in their business. Okay, next. So the other um, component I'm gonna talk about is social media. Um, social media is huge for us. We um, just find a lot of value in creating um, beautiful and inspiring content on social. It's just a great way to reach a ton of people who are interested in our products and help kind of move them through the funnel towards maybe a casual, you know, social media follower to a noonday diehard or an ambassador even. So um, a few things that we try to focus on when we're talking about storytelling on social is um, really defining what value are we offering to our customers. There are so many different kinds of stories that we could be telling and it can be hard to narrow it down. So we try to like define these anchors that we can constantly be asking, you know, is this content that we're putting out helping reinforce one of these ideas that we're trying to, trying to say to the customer, this is what we have to offer you. So for us, um, we're offering customers products that are made by hand they are impactful and make a difference and they're stylish. And like Joy was mentioning, we really um, 
think it's important to lead with style and to make sure that we're creating pieces that people actually love to wear. So those are kind of the, the anchors that we build our content around. And um, I think another important thing that we try to keep in mind is different customers or viewers are interested in different kinds of stories. So I think my tendency, especially when I started in this role, was just like, these stories are so amazing. Everyone should want to read a 2000 page manifesto about these women's lives and how it's changed. And, you know, these are just incredible stories and everyone should sit down and spend an hour reading them. But that's just not the reality for our customers, you know. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that some people, um, they're just looking for something beautiful that they're going to love to wear. And the story behind it is like icing on the cake. And that's fine. We value those customers and we want to keep them around because they ultimately are allowing us to grow our marketplace here and to provide more work. So um, just keeping in mind that different people are looking for different things. So the casual shopper might just want to see a quick how it's made video just to be able to see that the products they're interested in are special and they're made by hand. So a quick grab. Other people might want to read this longer form artisan story. So having you know, linking out to blog posts and things, just giving people an option to either get the quick grab or if they're interested in going deeper, clicking over to where they can do that and get more information. Um, other people, you know, you've got some people who are really into the quantitative um, impact, others more qualitative. So just trying to find a good balance between the personal stories and the impact stats and the hard numbers behind things because you're gonna, you know, in your customer base, have people who are interested in a different balance of those things. So you can go to the next one. These are just some examples that I pulled of some of our Instagram posts. So um, this is an example of a specific artisan story. And this is um, a woman that we've worked with for many years and we've really um, developed a relationship with her to where um, she's comfortable sharing these aspects of her, of her story with us and with our customers. So we were able to do that with this tie-in to Day of the Girl. I think that's another important thing to note that you can, you know, um, pay attention to what's going on both in the fair trade space and just generally with special days and holidays and how you can pull your content into that. So this was an example of a specific artisan story. Go to the next one. Um, and this is a similar, a similar one where Sunita has worked with us for several years and is kind of a leader in the artisan space. So we were able to um, share more and more in depth look at her story, but still trying to keep it pretty succinct. Next. And then we also sometimes just share these, you know, there's not faces in the photos. It's just kind of to show the handmade nature of the products and that they're really special. So this is depicting some of the upcycled artillery jewelry that we um, source from Ethiopia. Next. And similar here with this Uganda photo of some paper beads for some products that we are making. And, um, I think this one did really well just because it's a fun photo and it's pretty and that counts for a lot. Next. This, we'll see if this works. It's a video. So this is just showing the making of one of our cuffs from Guatemala and it's only about 13 or 14 seconds long. So just keeping in mind, you know, people have short attention spans. How can I convey what I want to convey really quickly? Um, this one is really speaking to how Noonday does business. So some of our pillars um, in, ter in terms of um, how we work with our artists and partners, long-term partnership and capacity building. So, you know, using a specific person in a specific moment to kind of speak to these bigger themes about how we work with our partners. Next. Um, and this is an example of kind of combining beautiful sort of a storytelling photo with some hard numbers that um, were pulled from our impact report. 
and there's a link to um, we put the link in our bio. If people want to go deeper, they can read the entire impact report. Next. Um, so these are just some general takeaways. Video is huge. People love it and it does really well on um, in terms of like bumping you up in people's feeds. Um, Instagram and Facebook just really like video. Keep it succinct even if you want to tell a thousand page story like I usually do and um, be really product focused and um, lead with your beautiful products and kind of support with story. And then these are just some ideas on incorporating Instagram stories and lives and how we choose to do that. So we have our, sometimes people from our team will be traveling and they um, will have them do in-country broadcasts. They're great for behind the scenes and more kind of casual, gritty stuff compared to the really polished things that might be in your feed, interviews with artisans, um, things like that. So yeah, I think that's all I had. Great. Thank you very much, Jen. I appreciate the, the overview here and um, a lot of good tips and takeaways. And, you know, we're always talking about in our, our work as well, this idea of meeting people where they are, right? Giving them not what you think they need, but um, a lot of different, different levels of engagement that they can step into wherever suits what, what their interests and their, their focuses are. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I know I'm, I'm definitely feeling inspired by those, those photos. I thank you for sharing. All right. So we're going to turn things over now to our, our third and final speaker for today, Andrew Gonzalez from Fairtrade USA, um, who will be sharing uh, a bit of uh, an example of a story um, from some of his time at Origin. Um, and I will bring us back up, Andrew, and turn it over to you. All righty then. Excellent. So everyone can hear me, right? We're all good. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, to, I guess, just give a little bit of context. Uh, as Susie was stating, I'm on our supply chain team here at Fairtrade USA. And the, the supply chain team is really uh, tasked and kind of in charge with being the ear to the ground for our organization. We interact the most with producers, whether they be factory workers or farmers, um, and help them through certification and implementing kind of in acting as um, assistants in having them implement the fair trade premium and kind of improve their communities. And so today I just wanted to give an example from a trip that I took in November of 2017, so almost a year ago now, to Northern Colombia to visit a couple of producers. I'm gonna truncate it a little bit and just talk about one coffee cooperative that I visited and then kind of on the back end talk a little bit about my thoughts about how I go about sharing stories. So as I said, I was in Northern Colombia visiting Asoprosierra, which is a small coffee cooperative uh, located in the north. Let's see. All right, so. Uh, it's located in the Sierra Nevada de Santa, Maria, uh, Santa Marta, um, which is a uh, mountain range that rises almost just straight up out of the ocean. You go from sea level all the way up to about 19,000 feet in the course of 20 miles. And so I flew into Santa Marta, way up there in the top left corner. Um, and boy, did I not know the journey that was in store for me. Um, after arriving in Santa Marta, I took a two almost three hour bus ride on a bus that kind of looked like this <laughs> um my journey wasn't over i got off on the end of the dusty highway and then proceeded to go up these switchback mountain roads on the back of a motorcycle kind of like this looking a little bit less elegant because the roads looked a little bit like this um it was raining um terribly uh, during that day and during that season and the roads were just near rivers almost in some uh, locations and it took us probably nigh on six hours to go uh, maybe just 10-15 miles up these roads to finally first up on more quick coffee break and then all the way up to this small community uh, in the mountains was my journey done there no not even close so after arriving in the village, 
uh, and having an overnight rest, uh, I got in the back of one of these, <laughs> a friendly mule, and went up some mountain trails that look like this a further two hours to finally arrive with good reward at the coffee farm the, um, of Yiribeth. Uh, Yiribeth is one of the, uh, she sits kind of as a manager with the cooperative and helps assist farmers, uh, but also has her own copper, her own coffee farm. And, you know, after the over 10 hour journey, we, we had finally arrived. And, you know, so many times I think that we forget that our journey with our food, with the hands that it touches, the lengths that it travels on the back of a mule two hours down the mountain to go in a truck down eight hours of muddy roads to finally arrive at the highway to get up to the city to get across the ocean to a roaster here in the United States. Um, it's incredible. And I just had a lovely, you know, half day with Yeri Beth. Uh, here she is. We walked the coffee farm. I don't actually work in the coffee department, so I learned uh, a lot from her and I could hear the tenderness in her voice as she listed off what berries were ripe, what berries were not, the local plant. So that's her brother's farm over there. That's her dad's farm, that side of the mountain. Uh, and just the, the, the eagerness and the, and, and the tenderness in her voice was so apparent. <laughs> and after our farm visit, I got back on the mule, came down to the small town and had this nice fireside chat, I guess, sans fireside, but uh, with Yeri Beth's father. And it was just absolutely um, astounding. He kind of walked me through this 10 year uh, journey of the history of paramilitary violence and oppression within uh, these communities and coffee communities at large. Whereas like recent as 10, 15 years ago, there was curfews implemented. Coffee farmers couldn't exit their homes at night for fear of being shot. Soldiers would often come and commandeer crops or supplies from local stores. Um, and it was just incredible to see the journey over the last 10 years and the government's further efforts and some peace accords signed. And, you know, things aren't perfect, but her father talked about music and happiness and peace of mind returning to their town. And you could hear radios in the evening and you could have festivals during the day. And hearing people laugh again as all the tenseness kind of slowly bit by bit unwound. Um, and though there's been, you know, much progress, farmers still face lots of adversity. And coffee farmers even in particular, you know, the price of coffee can change in the course of the day. It can be a dollar at 8 a.m. and drop to 40 cents by the time maybe you get your beans down to the market. And so these inequitable trading cycles really make it difficult for farmers to plan long term. And so it, it, it just really shows that our work is not over and it's you know, up to us to demand equitable and sustainable sourcing from the brands that we purchase from. It's you know, up to us as consumers, as part of this ecosystem that participates in these supply chains to stand up and say, no, we will not accept you know, farmers getting paid uh, money that's less than what it costs them to produce their, their food. No, we're not going to say okay to exploitation. And I guess just I kind of want to leave off the story with this quote from uh, Walter here. So Walter is a worker on a banana farm that I visited on the same trip. Uh, and we were chatting and, you know, he was telling me that fair trade not only helps workers, you know, not only helps farmers, but uplifts their family, their friends, and entire communities. It empowers them to achieve better standards of living, to recreate communities, and to look forward to a better future. Um, so many times, even here at our own organization, we can get so focused on the benefits to the person in the photo or the benefits to the individual farmer or worker and not recognize the ripple effects that uh, are achieved through uh, fair trade and you know, other sustainable means that for example, this uh, banana farm saved for five years all, almost all of their premium and are now uh, building a housing community and housing improvement project for uh, 90 workers or 90 families even, so more people. And these are families that are going to have concrete floors for the first time and tile roofs for the first time. Um, and it's fantastic. And, 
it really just goes to show because fair trade allows, you know, we have no stipulations on the premium, the workers and the farmers dictate everything. And, um, you know, getting back to the, like how I try to tell stories is that the workers are the experts. So many times it's a sad, it's a unfortunate narrative put on by organizations to tell about the naive or ignorant or helpless person in a disadvantaged community when really these people have desire, they have vision, they have purpose, uh, they just lack the access to equitable systems, they lack the resources. And so we have fair trade and me on supply chain, on the supply chain team, try to help facilitate that to enable them uh, and, and to work with them because, uh, you know, I am by no means an expert in any of their communities and uh, just assist in the way that I can for them to take charge as they know how to do and as they do to change their communities, to change their families. Um, and the ripple effects are amazing to see. Uh, so that's all I had for uh, slides. Um, but to, you know, the other speaker's point, I definitely agree with what's, you know, being said to make stories succinct, to make them sensory, talk about what you smell, talk about what you heard, talk about what you saw, if you can, you know, uh, name names, if you can, make sure it's not just a blank face on a, on a photo. Um, emphasize, you know, the empowerment, the capacity that these people have to be change makers and, and their own lives. And the the person's role that you're speaking with whether they be a consumer whether they be a brand or a trader or a customer and their role in kind of facilitating this sustainable ecosystem um yeah make it personal make it targeted sometimes people like numbers more than qualitative stories like the one i told you know curtail it uh to to the audience and i i guess always just maybe leave with a call of action um direct people maybe to how they can uh, enact change upon the, the situations that, that you're describing. So that's all I have to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate you sharing that story. Um, really great example of you know, how, we, how we make fair trade real, right, is sharing that, that very real, very physical journey um that you took there and that as you said all the all the coffee takes to get to us um from that farm um so we have about 15 20 minutes here um to open things up for for your questions um your thoughts any anything anyone on our our call today would like to chime in with um please remember that if you are muted we can't hear you um and if you are um chiming in with a question i would ask you to turn on your your video as well if you're on zoom so we can see you face to face um as we switch over into a discussion um and while uh while you think about what questions you might have here in our audience today i'll i'll kick us off um, with a, a question for, for any and all of our, our speakers today, um, thinking about the fact, you know, not all of us are Facebook friends with, um, with artisans, not all of us are, you know, have access to the, the stories and the travel and the resources from an organization or can, you know, get on the back of a mule in Colombia. Um, so what would you recommend to you know, the, those of us who don't have those more direct connections as we think about how to talk about um, fair trade and what that means for the, the producers and, and the people that maybe we don't have that opportunity to meet directly. Um, I'll give it a shot. I think um, for people who, are, who don't have that direct connection, um, I think really leaning on on the organizations who do have the connection, who you're working with, to um, kind of explain what their approach is to storytelling and story gathering, and explain to to explain their philosophy behind it, and just make sure that um, their approach is in line with your values. So 
um, you know, we talked a little bit about making sure stories are empowering and respectful. So I would just ask, you know, when you, when you guys go to these communities and talk with them, um, how do you ensure that you have permission to share their stories? What's, what's your approach in interviews, kind of the ethics behind how they do that story gathering and what their goals are when they're doing that? to make sure that that is aligned with the kind of stories that you want to tell. And if it is, and if you sort of through that audit process, find that um, the way that they are doing this work is consistent with how you want to be doing it, then just really leaning heavily on them to um, provide you with that content. And I think also sometimes um, not assuming that producer groups, um, understand why you are asking for these stories like I've had situations where um, an artisan entrepreneur we work with in India who's been in the fair trade space for a long time and is a super savvy guy um, came to visit us here in our office and kind of got to see what a noonday trunk show looks like and how amb our ambassadors are sharing their stories he actually got to go to a trunk show which was really fun and he said to me I really didn't understand why this was so important, like why people needed to hear these individual stories. Um, I think he tended to be more on the uh, quantitative side, just personally. So it was really helpful to, for us to be able to explain to him like how those stories are actually being shared and what value that adds for them as our business partners. So it, it makes people want to buy their products more basically. And whenever I actually just got back from a trip to Guatemala where I was doing some interviews with some of our artists and partners. And I always try to open with thanking them and then explaining why we're doing it. You know, um, it's because people want to feel connected to them and want to learn more about their lives, but also it makes them want to buy more jewelry and, you know, these artisans are savvy. They are business people. They want to sell more products. So just making sure that that those partners are are on board and kind of understand the mentality behind why storytelling matters. Yeah, I mean, if I have to give my two cents kind of around it, you know, to your point, uh, Susie, not everyone has the opportunity to hop on the back of a mule and go up the mountains. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, in, in alignment with Jenna, I mean, just really utilizing the existing resources that other organizations uh, have available, uh, whether that be brands, whether that be organizations like Fairtrade USA. Um, I mean, if you're interested and you really want to get um, emotional and, and, and empowered and want to speak with passion, you know, delving into the literature, looking at uh, books about maybe specific countries or industries or contexts that you're interested in. Um, learning a, a little bit more kind of nuanced information about that and you can leverage and then bring that to the table when you're having those stories, when you're uh, in those discussions. So that way, maybe you haven't met, you know, a Yiri Beth in Santa Marta, but you can talk to Yiri Beth and have this surround sound of, of knowledge about maybe the coffee market, about maybe agriculture in, in general, whether whatever, you know, topic or, or sector that is. Um, yeah. yeah, I think just making sure you're leaving assumptions behind um, is the, the biggest thing on our end. Um, uh, what we've seen recently is that, um, you know, we work with women who have histories of violence against women, and uh, it's become like a trendy topic, which is a weird way to say it. Um, but people are like wanting to talk more and more about like sex trafficking and like these women have been rescued from sex trafficking. Um, but that's not how the women want to be talked about. Um, and so while, yeah, I think what everybody said is like utilizing what brands do have. And if it's, if it doesn't exist, like don't, don't make it up. Um, and like figuring out, okay, where, where is my expertise? Like, what can I bring to this conversation then? Because if it's not an artisan story, then maybe it's how to wear it or like, you know, what fair trade impact looks like in a certain community or um, what that can look like. I think um, Freeset did a really great job of this recently, actually. They, um, they put out a new like brand portfolio. I, I, don't, I don't know what you would call it, brand guidelines maybe. And they had all of their partners sign it 
um, that they had read it because they no longer wanted their artisans to be talked about uh, in the way that was becoming pretty pervasive and instead talking about them as women with agency. Um, I, I think they do a, an exceptional job. Thank you for that. Yeah, that I, I think Joy was your comment earlier of, you know, would the, think about what you're sharing and whether it's something you would share directly with the person you're talking about. You know, if you if you had the opportunity um, to be in the same room, would you still phrase it in the same way or share the same information? And I think that's a good good guiding principle for, for all of us. Um, So I'm going to pause for, for a moment here and, and give everyone a chance to share your questions or offer up any, any stories that are on your mind or part of your, your own um, fair trade conversations that you put out into the world. I uh, would love to hear from the, the folks on our call with us today. Um, I have a question for Joy. I would love to just hear... Um, you know, you mentioned that sex trafficking and the abuse of women is kind of right now, and that there's ways that these women do not want to be talked about. So can you give some examples of the messaging you use, the language you use in, in talking about their situations in a way that is clear and communicates sort of the need and the impact, but is also dignified? Because um, we work with um, a lot of diff different artisans in different kinds of um, situations, but some of the people we work with are in, in that situation where they have, um, you know, spent time on the streets or working in a brothel. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, language is always really important. And I think how you, how you frame things, um, like even just thinking about like, context here in St. Paul, like I always try to say like a person experiencing homelessness as opposed to like a homeless person um, and like making sure they're human first, right? Before like whatever thing, whatever I, piece of their, their identity we're going to like frame them as. Um, and so, I mean, it, it really depends on the different women. Um, honestly, I don't talk about many women's experiences with violence because just about all like it, it's a kind of a taboo topic here in the United States even more of a taboo topic uh, around the world and so talking more about um, a fair trade job as agency to leave an abusive partner as opposed to um, like what personal abuses a woman may have suffered um, yeah I guess just time and time again we've seen that <laughs> like a lot of these women do have Facebook pages and they don't want um like if their cousin goes on Facebook and like you know sees this picture associated with the story um you know the chances of it happening are low but like they they just don't want to see it um so like we we work with a group of women in uh Ethiopia women who uh have formerly been prostituted also and but when talking to these women, not a single one wanted us to share that part of their story. And so it's, it's been interesting, I, I think, especially like navigating between um, like managers of cooperatives and like they talk about it in that way. So then we think it's okay to talk about it in that way. But when I was just there in June, like none of these women wanted to talk about it. And so that has been like a trigger for me now. Okay, like how do we change the way our entire team is talking about these women? Um, and make sure all of our content online like go back and <laughs> scratch it all and and what does that look like to really put um the woman's identity first as a as a maker as an entrepreneur as a change maker um and for the most part we are leaving out um the the experience with violence unless we're talking about it um, in a more broad a broad sense that's why i end up talking about um my own history with violence probably more than I would like to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. If anyone has ideas on how to do that better, <laughs> I'm always, I'm all ears. Do you offer them, um, you know, to use a pseudonym and not include their photo? Like, do you think 
it's the name recognition as opposed to it just being too uncomfortable for them to share their story? Or do you think, which one of those do you think it leans towards? Um, yeah, I mean, some, sometimes women are fine with, with a quote. Um, and that's like, they want people to know how, how much they've overcome to like be the powerful woman that they are now. And then like, by all means, girl, like, get it, <laughs> you know, like we will, we will brand that for you, like on board, you know, but um, I think, I think part of it is, is really just about power dynamics. And so like, there's a group of women that we work with in India. And one of the most powerful moments I had this year probably was when we, I entered in this circle of women, you know, they're working on the floor in a circle as they prefer to do. And I walk in white American, you know, in a, in a privileged, there, there's already this pretty intense power dynamic, right? But I sit down on the floor, cross-legged in a dress, which I don't know how they all do, but you know, figuring it out. And um, we start talking about first like kind of small talk and whatnot, but eventually get into to my own history um, of rape. And I think that really, it like you could immediately feel the power dynamics in this room change. Um, like, I guess not an understanding that uh, that kind of violence like happens in the United States or happens to like a person like me, right? Um, and then being able to talk openly about that. And then it, it's usually, we have this open conversation and then after maybe a couple hours of talking, then we talk about like, you know, I talk about my story with our customers because it's helping, um, will be more comfortable talking about it. We have, can have more conversations like this. Like, are there aspects that you would be comfortable sharing without a face, um, without a name? Um, if not, that's cool. But um, I think trying to put myself closer to this, like a, a similar level um, has helped um, women open up and like maybe a language to talk about it too. Yeah, that's great. All right, so we're just a, a few minutes away from the, the end of our hour together here. Um, and so I'll, I'll take us into a little bit of a, a wrap up. Um, once again, thank you so much to Joy and Jenna and Andrew for, for being with us and, and sharing their, their insights and their own stories. Um, I know I learned a lot from this and I'm, I'm feeling very inspired by, by everything that you shared, um, right? And the, these pieces that we can take away with us into our, our work and our advocacy and our conversations, right? So sharing your own story, um, telling the positive sides, right? Not just focusing on the, the negative or the, the sob story, but really celebrating the positive. Um, asking permission where you can, I think that's so important. It doesn't matter what we're talking about if we're, we're sharing someone else's experience. So that permission is so critical and important. Um, and meeting your audience where you are, I always come back to that with fair trade and with anyone else that you're approaching to, to share your own passions and, and commitments, help make that personal and make it resonate for them um, to, to bring it forward and, and let them then take it into their own life and, and tell that story for their own selves. Um, so I will wrap us up just to share briefly if you want to keep talking um, with us. Uh, we'll be we having more conversations, excited to, to keep um, these fair trade conversations going. Uh, in March of next year, we are convening our next national conference in Chicago. Very excited to be um, joining into the, the Chicago fair trade community and, and bringing our national fair trade community together there March 1st through 3rd. Um, hope everyone can can join us if possible um, and then also for any um, of our student audience student members we are running our fair trade finals program um, to help all of our high school and college advocates share fair trade and build awareness on their campuses um, and, and grab an extra cup of coffee during finals week to keep you all going strong um, so with that please join me in thanking Jenna Joy and Andrew and thank you all for being with us.